Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. go here we are mr perry welcome to the first of hopefully many of the principles of performance podcast welcome everyone my name is eric degatti along with my good friend mike um and so since this this is our, our our virgin voyage here we probably should introduce ourselves and let people know just who the heck we are and, and how we got to here and why they should actually even listen to us so i'll, I'll let you kind of take the lead with that one and, and run with it mike I guess I'm up first. So yeah, I've been a strength and conditioning coach going on uh, 20 years now. Um, we've, we currently own a gym called Skill of Strength. Uh, Skill of Strength we're located in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Uh, we've been doing that for approximately 10 years. In addition to that, um, I am a lead instructor for functional movement systems, a senior instructor for Strong First, and I'm also fortunate enough to go out and lecture for Perform Better. I would say our bread and butter at the gym is probably adult group training. We do a fair amount of performance training as well. And um, I think if anybody sort of knows my name, it's probably because of the athletes that I work with in the UFC. So I spend a lot of time with combat athletes. So I'm fortunate enough to have uh, the experience working with just about every population out there. I've worked with elementary school, middle school, college, high school, pros, Olympians, you name it. So over this last you know, 20 years, uh, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And that's really the point of this podcast is to share the mistakes we've made, but also share the successes that we've had. So we can pass that knowledge on to everybody that's listening. So I'm pretty pumped to be here. And uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about our experience and dive into some topics. Awesome. Well, uh, my name is Eric Degatti, as you could tell by my exotic accent, I come from New Jersey. And uh, so I've been doing it a little bit longer than Mike, only because I'm a little bit older. I got got some years on him, but uh, I'm on year 24 um, and ranging from everything from just a, a fitness professional starting off in a gym to getting more into the performance side and getting the ability to work with teams at all levels from from the um you know, middle school level all the way up to the professionals. Uh, as you can tell by the jerseys in the back, I was a consultant for the New York Football Giants for for uh, nine years, uh, from 2007 to 2016, which concluded two Super Bowls to uh, uh, with wins against a team to be unnamed. Um, but we'll 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 go back and forth about that, I'm sure, along the along the way. Um, I'm also a, a lead instructor for functional movement systems, and that's how Mike and I met. Um, and so what happened was, is him and I were talking, uh, we were down at one of the, the virtual courses down at headquarters in, in Danville, Virginia. And we were just kind of talking about like, hey, what could we do from an educational standpoint? And uh, we both had all this experience and we wanted to kind of pay it forward. We've, we've both mentored a bunch of different trainers, whether as part of our staff, because I also used to own a facility for 12 years here in New Jersey called One Human Performance, which is a multidisciplinary center. Um, and so we said, well, what's the, the biggest gap we see, right? We go out, we teach all around the world and, and what's the biggest missing link. And, and we both ironically landed on program design. We said, look, a lot of people know all these different methods of the West side method or Pilates or uh, grass and technique or whatever these things, which are all awesome. Um, but they didn't really have any principles to tie it to. And so when they got back Monday morning from that weekend course, they had no idea how to actually apply it and write a program. So 
we said, let's let's dive into this thing. And it's been a, a, a work in progress for about the last two years and been a very cool experience to, to kind of put together a course we call Principles of Program Design. And what we started doing is to kind of get the word out and share some of our content and get people to know about us is doing a lot of social media posts. And we would do a theme each week. Well, one week would be mobility and the next week would be train for power. And, and then what we did is we'd sum up at the end of the week with an Instagram Live. Um, we got some awesome feedback on that other than the fact that people People had struggles getting on Instagram or getting on live or being there when we were doing it. And so this was the next evolution. And so here we are with it, with the podcast, we have all those lives uh, on the books. We're going to be posting those videos on our YouTube. You can go back and, and watch those at any time, but we figured we we're going to start this thing off with a point that Mike hit on. And it's interesting, Mike, cause I'm um, uh, going back through uh, a second round in, in uh, Tim Ferriss's book, tribe of mentors. Um, Tim Ferriss, if you're not familiar with it, New York uh, Times bestselling author, wrote a bunch of different books, starting with the four hour work week uh, and all the way down. Very cool guy. I actually had the opportunity to uh, to work with Tim because uh, he did a blurb for Gray Cook's book, uh, Movement Book. So he came in and got a movement screen with me and did some work with him. But um, in his book, he asks all these po- uh, all these very successful people from all different walks of life, these series of questions. And one of the questions he asked them is, what was your favorite failure? Do you have a favorite failure? And so it kind of got me thinking about, all right, that's a perfect way to lead this thing off because we, we stand in front of our course. We sit here, you know, on this podcast, not saying, Hey, we have 40 something years of experience. Let me tell you how smart we are. Right. We're going to actually take a little bit unique approach and say, we only got here by making a whole lot of mistakes, by screwing it up. I always joke that, that, that you know, I have my doctorate from SSU, which is the, the university of screwing shit up, right? And so um, uh, what we did is we compiled a list and we said, if we're going to talk about programming, let's talk about what are the 10 biggest programming mistakes that we see out there and how we've probably made each one of them in a different way. So we're kind of just going to work down the list and, and go back and forth and have some conversation, have some fun with it. So um, I'm going to start off with the first one is is because now as a consultant and I work with a lot of teams and teams, you know, coaches will come to me and they'll say, you know, can you look at our program? And the first thing I see as a, as a major issue is that there's just way too many exercises. Right. So the first mistake of of just having this laundry list of 12, 14, 16 exercises in a program is overwhelming. Um, and so the, the, the first issue I have with that is there's there's especially on working in a team setting and Mike, you work in an adult group fitness setting is it's really hard to teach uh, precise execution of a movement. Now do that times 16 in a very limited time span the chances that you're doing it well, that you're going to get the result that you want are, are going down every time you add another exercise to that program, right? So that's one of the big things I see with like, just just too many exercises. Like your, your program's way too long. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, what happens is as people gain some knowledge in the industry and they get exposed to maybe new coaches or read new blogs or whatever, they see a cool exercise and they're like, that seems cool. I should do that. And they see another person, well, that seems cool, I should do that. And then the problem is, is they have all these cool ideas, and they just throw them in the program without thinking about, well, you know, why is it there? And, and um, you know, you know, how can, not so much how is it there, but they just throw them in because they think they're cool, but they don't, they don't actually know why they belong within the program. And I think that's one of the biggest issues people come across is they just throw stuff in there because it looks cool, or it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a novel new thing. But it really it really may not belong there to begin with. They're just throwing it in to, to do something new and, and new is not always better, right? And that's one of the biggest issues that I see is people get excited about new exercises, just like they get excited when they take a course. And what do they do is they, they basically throw all of these exercises at someone because they just learn them. And every trainer makes that mistake and we've done it too. And one of the things that we're trying to do is educate people on, hey, listen, You don't need to do it all. You just need to do a handful of things really, really well. You have to be relentless with the basics. And yes, there's 9,000 cool, uh, 9,000 like lunge variations out there, but maybe you only need like a single one and practice that two days a week for the first four weeks and then add a layer on top of that. So I think people get enamored with the fancy stuff and they, maybe they even get bored, but at the same time, I mean, the best coaches in the world, they stick to the basics and even if they do add variety, it's usually just a small change from the basics. 
So and the other thing is more is not always better. You know, I, I, I just thought of my brother is a, a physical therapist. And uh, at some point, we're actually going to get him on as a guest. And, uh, and so um, he was telling me when he was working in a clinic uh, in the city, he had one of the, the, the Yankees players come in. And it was a guy who was known for chronically being injured. And this guy would come and before he, he would get there early, like a half hour before his appointment, and he would go through this litany of all these corrective exercises. And you know what it was? And he just kept turning pages. And it was literally because he'd been hurt his entire career, he'd been to a lot of physical therapists. He'd been through a lot of rehab. So all he did was to take every rehab program and just keep stacking the next one on top of it and stacking the next one on top of it. So he just ended up doing all of it. And so, it, but obviously it wasn't working. Um, and then also you don't know, even if it did work, you didn't know what worked or when it worked because you just kept adding things. So listen, when your, your, your name ends with a vowel and you're from New Jersey, there's one thing you're really passionate about is how you make your sauce, right? And so great sauce is not a ton of ingredients, right? And, and if you put too much in, it actually ruins it. And you can tell a, a really lousy made, um, you know, a marinara sauce or sauce because it has too many ingredients, right? The best ones are the most simple ones that are, that are really fresh and well put together in just the right amounts. So that's the kind of thing with too many exercises. I mean, if you take this to the, to the most elegant and brilliant way I've seen it done is Mike, you work with Pavel Satsala, right? And his, all of his books are minimalist approaches going, starting back from, you know, uh, the naked warrior, where it was just two exercises. It was a single arm push up, and it was the um, pistol squat. And then every book thereafter was just that two exercises that had really deep meaning and was really done to a, an, uh, a level of elegance and precision that, that most people don't even touch in their, in their exercise. So kind of tell me about like, cause being in and around Pavel, like how that affects your programming approach when you talk about this simplicity and minimalism type of approach? Well, I think one of the things that Pavel does really well is, is he can take a lot of uh, dense science-based information and boil it down in, in an easy to digest fashion. I think that's one thing that Pavel does really well. But the other thing that he does really, really well is, again, he can take two exercises and create an intricate program with just two exercises based off of, you know, changing the density, changing, um, you know, the sets and reps, changing all these different variables. And, and really what he's doing, if you think of like an equalizer, like the old school equalizers that you would get on stereos, most of you probably don't even know what we're talking about. Um, if you're, if you're probably like 25 or under, you probably have no idea what we're talking about, but um, it, you know, the old school stereos, you have these little equalizers and you could bring the mid range up and you could bring the base down and you can manually tweak things. So what Pavel does is that's what he does he basically will shift these these little changes in the program and have these little subtleties that will over time make a difference because if you think about the principles of strength training it's stress and adaptation so um, he does a really good job of knowing when to if we are going to stress the system a little bit more the next time that we train we need to have sort of a, a lower stim day right and it's just it's 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 basically a form of undulating periodization and what he does is he just he does an incredible job of, of making it work. And is it easy? No, it's, it's, it's going to get hard, right? Because you have to put the work in, but it's, it's very simple to follow. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why some people don't like Pavel's work is because they want to be entertained. They're not really concerned about getting really good results or getting strong. They just, they want a bunch of cool random exercises because they're, they say that they want to get strong, but in, in actuality, they just want to be entertained a little bit more because they're getting bored with what they're doing. And, and if we're being brutally honest, you know, some of the best coaches out there have the most boring programs, but they're devastatingly effective. So, um, you know, success leaves clues, but I mean, simplicity is absolutely the way to go. You just have to know how to dose it and program it and understand how to get that proper stress so you can get that adaptation that you're looking for. Okay. Now, so, so let's go to number two, which is a great segue into um, how boring is sometimes, you know, blessed in, in our business. And so the big mistake that I made early on is trying to impress you, right? And I'm going to give you all my Latin terms that I know, and I'm going to talk about as many different fancy concepts as possible. At the end of the day, number one, you probably don't care as the client. And number two is you definitely don't understand um, and even if you did try to wrap your head around, it, it's not happening at the reflexive level that we need it to happen when you're actually, you know, training. And so overcoaching is a huge mistake. And so 
the better I've gotten at this, you know, you know, we go out and, and, and teach and sometimes, you know, I'm sure you get this where people say, oh, I'd love to come and watch you do some sessions. And I'm going to say, it's going to be surprisingly boring, right? Especially like in the beginning when I'm teaching you how to move, I'm not giving you a thousand cues. You know what I'm telling you? Basically <laughs> over and over, slow down, breathe, figure it out. That's pretty much it. Right. Yeah. And the, the, and, and as people get better, you know, it's funny, I'm sure you get this as well, is that they get nervous when I don't say anything, right? They're doing, they do go through a whole set and I don't say a word and they're like, uh, is that okay? I said, yeah, if you're shutting me up, you're doing something right. I don't want to talk, right? So yeah. I talk all day. So the, the thing is, is if you're doing it right, I, I shouldn't have to say a word. I don't need to, to hear myself think. Uh, out loud and just give you a cue for everything. We don't need to overcoach it. And not to mention, you're not going to be in their ear when they're running down the field or they're out on the mat or they're, they're going about their life. You need to make it so it's, you're mm -hmm. creating this level of, of unconscious competence where they, they can actually have ownership. And so the less you can coach and the more they can get accomplished with the least amount of coaching, I think is the, the true sweet spot of, of what we do. Absolutely. And um, you're, there's this old saying, and I think it was from Cook is, you know, position dictates function. And I think if we understand the basics of biomechanics, and we understand, you know, each person's movement competency and anthropometry, which is, uh, you know, all, those three things are going to give us a lot of information on what that individual is currently capable of. But then we need to put them in positions where they can feel it, right. And I think one of the biggest issues with overcoaching is we're always like, you know, point your toe in flex this flex this do this do this and we give them 37 cues and, and they're just sitting there like what the hell but if we put them in a scenario, where they can start to feel something, and, and uh, it, we create awareness, that's when the magic happens. Because like you said, if they're sprinting down the field, or they're doing something that's performance oriented, we can't give them all these cues. And I'll give you a quick example, I was teaching a couple of my staff members the other day, kind of some uh, progressions on the kettlebell swing. And I took them through a bunch of different, you know, positions and setups and isometrics. And I didn't mention, hey, do you feel your glutes? I didn't have to say do this, do this. I just let them feel the positions and let them feel the shapes. I gave them a little bit of cueing based off of what I was seeing, but it was very, very minimal. And you should have seen them. They were like, wow, I really felt that, or that makes a ton of sense. So when you have skin in the game and you're willing to learn, you're actually going to, you're going to learn a little bit faster because um, you're, you're in it, you're feeling it, you're experiencing it. And I think that's one thing people don't do enough of is, is you gotta, you gotta get in there and just, and do the work. And I could give someone 15,000 cues and they could be the best cues in the world, but if they're not getting into that position and feeling what they're supposed to be feeling, those cues are pretty much useless. So I think uh, we need to we need to start thinking about how we can get our point across. Um, with uh, we still want to use cueing, but overcoaching and cueing is a different thing. And if you find you have to give thirty seven different cues to uh, get your client to do something, either one they're not ready for it, or um, you know two it could be just a scenario where maybe they they lack coordination or there could be something else going on but i'm telling you i've had the best success just by putting in the putting them in the basic starting position and it's never going to be perfect and then a simple simple cue and then have them feel it out and and then ask them for feedback and it's just rinse and repeat there isn't uh there isn't too much besides that yeah well actually to steal gray cook's line is is the language of movement is written in feel Right. And, and so we can't always express those, you know, in words in terms of what they're supposed to do. And plus, everybody's going to have a different thing. If, um, and, and Greg Rose, Dr. Greg Rose, who, um, who founded TPI and works with us at FMS, he, he has a great way of talking about the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic cues. And, and like you, Mike, I'm very rarely saying tighten, brace, squeeze, engage, or, or, or re referring to any body parts. Um, and he, you know, if you just ask somebody to take, you know, as much of a turn as you can to the right and ask them what they feel, you may ask five people the same question, but get five different results. And so, um, because of that, we can't put our experience in impose that on our client because they may be experiencing something different in terms of that feel. So let them experience and let them make mistakes. We learn in movement from our mistakes, just like we're learning globally here in terms of programming from mistakes, you learn a movement from mistakes. If you're not making those mistakes, you'll never, never be able to correct that. So then if we take it more on, on, on uh, taking a step back on just 
instead of the movements, if we look at the program itself, number three is we, we try to make things too complicated, right? And everybody likes to, to impress each other on Twitter where they're going to show their sequence for how they're implementing a conjugate method with French contrast with a, with a uh, um, maximum aerobic speed finisher. And like, so I'm going to throw as many, you know, um, big words, the big words. acronyms and systems and in, into one superset as possible. Um, and so at the end of the day, it, it doesn't get that message. I don't know if it gets actually passed on to the client or athlete or patient where they actually understand, well, here's Look, you're gonna do a you're gonna do a, a loaded squat, and then as soon as you're done, you're gonna jump. So it's the same movement, except we have different amplitudes and, and different loads. Um, because this is gonna this one's gonna get you stronger to produce more force, and this one's gonna get you to be able to access that much more quickly. And it's pretty much as simple as that, just with a lot of fancy terms. Because at the end of the day, if you're selling a system, you got to come up with something unique, other than the five second explanation I just gave you. So. I think sometimes we, we write programs not, and this sounds crazy, I think we sometimes write programs not for the end user. We write them to impress our, our um, echo chamber and to impress ourselves. Yeah, and, and, and social media is a big part of self-promotion, right? And um, if you look at a lot of this stuff on social media, it's based off of um, new things, like things that are either funny or impressive or obviously there's the, uh, you know, there's a component where less close equals more likes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things where things get boring and we understand that things get boring, but boring works. And that's the hard part. And it's, and it's one of those scenarios that if you ask anybody about how they coach and, and how they actually do things, I think people, if they truly understand how to learn, um, it's a very simple process. You go step one, step two, step three. And a lot of people think, well, after step three, we need step four and five. But a lot of the times, if you're having issues or there's there's a sort of a snag in the, in the training program, sometimes you just need to go back down that ladder, back down to step two for a little bit, right? So I, I just think we just get enamored with the, the big words and the fancy stuff. And, and I've done it myself. I've you know, I've used the lingo to try to sound smart and try to impress other people. And usually I'll be honest with you, when I was using that lingo, I didn't understand it in the way that I understand it now. And now that I understand it, I never use that lingo anymore because I really don't care. I just care about the result. And that's at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, right? Like, you know, if, if your athlete or your client is, is working towards their goals or hitting their goals, does it really, really matter how they get there and, and what fancy words that you use? And and I should have prefaced this by saying when we name drop something, you know, if I talk about triphasic or I drop in, you know, one of these things, all these systems are awesome, right? Um, and and have have a ton of value provided you place them in the right spot and you know how to 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 progress and regress and, and apply them properly. Um, and then I would, you know, I'd almost argue your, your, your point there, Mike, where, you know, everybody wants new, what they don't realize is whatever is new is just a different name on something that was being already done 20, 30, thousand years ago, right? You know, all the, the things I just mentioned that are, that are getting clicks from strength coaches on Twitter right now, Charlie Francis was doing that 30 years ago. Right. Um, Louis Simmons was doing it at West Side 25 years ago. Um, I, you know, I joke when we te when I teach, I say, listen, um, in terms of movement stuff and, and training, I said, do we have any yogis who are, you know, thousand to two thousand years old in the room? Right. And then I said, OK, do we have any ancient Greeks in the room? I said, OK, well, unless you're one of those things, you probably didn't invent a damn thing. Right. And the ancient Greeks were using medicine balls. Most of the movements and the, and the mobility stuff that we do in all these postures and positions and flows, they're all stolen from yoga. Right. So we're just standing on the shoulders of a bunch of people who learn stuff. And we're just learning a little bit better and more efficient ways of pack, packaging things on one end. And on the second end is we have better feedback tools now, like a lot of the things that we learned initially. Um, I, I remember when I learned about in school in the late 90s about hypertrophy training, right? It was in this very strict window of six to 12 reps. And now that they have better ways of looking at muscle biopsy and studying the you know, tissue and how it gets affected by stress is that you, know, you look at the work of like Andy Galpin talking about like you can get hypertrophy from like three to 30, right? That's a, a much different, more broad scope 
than this really rigid thing that we learned initially because we have better ways of seeing things. And so um, that's kind of, you know, my counterpoint to the new thing. Now, you know, a lot of the, the, the discussion we've almost had so far goes to our next point in that um, I have to catch myself a lot of times and in, in step back and look at the big picture and look at all the variables. Um, and we get too biased on looking everything as far as a strength program right? Because that's the biggest thing we're going to have the most direct impact when people come in for a coaching session, um, or an individual session. You know, most of what we're going to do is we're going to do that for the most part, if people are doing their conditioning, right, we're not usually running alongside with them for, for a mile run or going out for a swim with them or they're cycling, we're not going home with them and, and grocery shopping and cooking their food. Like, so a lot of these other factors that are insanely important, we forget about that are as impactful, if not more impactful to their program than just the strength training. Now that, that's not minimizing strength training. Strength training is an incredibly impactful. It's, it's, it's like a fountain of youth. One of the most like, you know, I think it was uh, uh, Peter Atia or Dr. Human. One woman was saying is if you actually looked at exercise and even strength training and you had it in a pill form and said, this is all things it could do for you. No one would believe it. It would sound like some hokey middle of the night commercial. Um, but I think we get too caught up in just only looking at strength training and not thinking enough about cardiovascular training, not thinking about enough recovery, not thinking about all those other things that encompass a true training program. Yeah. And I think also too, when it comes to, especially when working with athletes, I think a lot of strength and conditioning coaches have egos and one of the metrics they want to use to show off is, Hey, look how strong my athletes are. And, and, uh, you know, I'll let you tell the, the story about John Green at, uh, at Indianapolis, but, um, you know, I think far too many people are so focused on strength that they forget about the other things. And, um, you know, there's, there's record boards in, in weight rooms all over the United States, whether it's high school and college. Um, but no one's, uh, you know, no one's out there saying, Hey, look at my clients, uh, you know, lateral lunge and look at the quality of that lateral lunge or look at how well my client can deep squat with, with this, or, you know, look at how well my client can overhead squat with a single kettlebell. So, and again, it, it's funny because no one really cares about those those other things like movement quality and flexibility and motor control, because uh, they're not as sexy and, and no one's going to have their motor control records on the, on the, you know, on the wall. But I think one of the things that happens is we equate strength with if someone gets stronger, they're immediately going to be a better athlete. And in some cases it will help. But I think at a certain point, if we're chasing strength, because we think that's that, that is the only quality we need to develop. That's where we get lost because um, you know, time and time again, I see all these athletes that are doing these really, you know, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, um, and they have all these record in the gym, uh, these records in the gyms. And, and, and a lot of the times they're the most injured and they're far from being the best player on the team. So is it really that important to chase these high end metrics or is it really important to just win football games or, or lacrosse games or soccer or basketball games? Right. And I think if you are competing on a team, strength is important. But there are so many other qualities that need to be developed. And I think it's just a strength coach ego. We all want our clients to do well. And uh, no one's, you know, everybody, everybody posts PRs. We all do that, right? But no one's going to be like, hey, here's my client's uh, four by eight single arm uh, floor press at, you know, 75 to 80%. Like no one wants to hear that because it's, it's not sexy, but um we, there are so many other considerations and things that we need to focus on from a health standpoint and strength is important, but it's not the end all be all. Yeah. I'm, I'm dealing with it right now with all my high school coaches uh, as the time of this recording, um, all the high school coaches that I work with start football practice next week. And so I had a couple coaches saying, Hey, are we going to max out this week? And I said, no, we don't need to. We, we've been, We've been doing percentage, you know, percentage work and we, with our big lifts, I'll use uh, some of Jim Wendler's five, three, one system. So we have a little bit more tightly programmed weights for everybody. And we're seeing the numbers change. You're seeing progress. Do I need to add, do a one rep max, which one high school kids aren't generally technically sound enough to get a good, true one rep max. And two is, do I really want to do that much stress on my athletes the week before they're going to start practice? Absolutely not. So, um, you know, that's the extreme end of the strength stuff. But even with with our, our, our general clients, right, your 45 year old salesperson, accountant, you know, stay at home mom, whoever it may be, 
their their life isn't going to change that much more for them if they can you know, if they can deadlift a, a 90 pound kettlebell versus an 80 pound kettlebell, it's just not. And, and they don't care about those metrics. So what's going to make a difference to them is, is their quality of life better? Do they move better? Do they feel better? Do they, do they perform better in, in, in their everyday function? So I think we need to look at other metrics as well. Now, talking about strength, the other thing that's a big mistake in, in number four is, um, uh, actually, number five, we're at number five, I'm losing track here. Um, number five is our, our lack of appreciation for tempo, intent, force dynamics, like we're so just focused on muscles, right? Because that's where we're, we're so biased, we've been so entrenched in this bodybuilding type of mentality, which bodybuilding training is not a bad thing. And that's become like a, a whipping, uh, you know, post for, for, for a lot of people. But, uh, you know, bodybuilding training is not a bad thing. I'm actually going to have a friend of mine who's a pro bodybuilder on the show at some point to talk about real bodybuilding training. But bodybuilding training, what it did is everybody thought of things in terms of muscles. Like what does, you know, every exercise, what does this work, right? We had gyms filled with nothing but equipment with little sketch pictures of highlighted muscles of that's what this machine that costs $4,000 works. There's this one specific part, which even those diagrams most of the time are wrong. Um, so because of that, you don't understand, like people will say, all right, I work with a lot of baseball players. So shoulders are important. So they're going to say, well, if I do this, um, yoga pose this really challenges my shoulders so this should be good for baseball because baseball uses your shoulders well that's a big leap right so if this is you know you need short you know shoulder stability and in, in, in healthy shoulders for baseball is point a and um you know, then you have point C uh, of, of yoga, you jumped over one thing, like that doesn't necessarily directly connect that, you know, throwing a baseball is a huge different um, dynamic uh, demand on, on your shoulder than holding a yoga pose is. Now, is there going to be some carryover? And is that a maybe an entry point? Yes. But in, in just looking at terms and things of, hey, how do I work this part? And not you know, understanding that, well, what does that part need to do? Does it need to decelerate? Does it need to accelerate? How much force does it need to produce? There's a big difference between your shoulder stability of um, your MMA fighters, right? That are trying to get their shoulders ripped out of the socket by monsters in a cage versus I'm throwing a five ounce ball at a much higher amplitude, right? They both need a tremendous amount of shoulder mobility and stability. But if we don't respect you know, amplitude and how we program our tempos and, and, and those things like that's, you know, another thing when I review programs and I look at, you know, they have their exercises, they have their reps and sets, but there's never anything in terms of regard to tempo. There's a huge difference between me taking a bench press and a one count down, bounce it off my chest, one count up and, and then right back down again versus a four count down a dead stop pause and then exploding up versus a five count down, two second pause and a five second up. Same exercise, same movement will create dramatically different effects in terms of what the end result is because of just that one variable that so many people skip over. Yeah, and there's the also the component of skill acquisition, right? I think a lot of people just want to bomb through everything and they, you know, you see an, ear, an inexperienced young athlete doing a squat and they just drop down really quick and they don't have control, their knees are hitting each other, it doesn't look well, you see the same thing in, you know, walking lunges where, you know, kids just want to breeze through the warm up and, you know, they take that stride, they put their hands on their knee, they're collapsing at their posture and they're standing up pushing their hand on their knee. And I think a lot of the times people just think, well, I just want to, yeah, I want to get through this quickly, or just if I, if I do it faster, that's going to be better. And I think when we slow things down, it also gives us an appreciation to feel like we were talking about. And when you can feel it, you can start to change it. And at certain points, velocity is important. And at certain points, it's not that important. And it depends on what your goal is, your training experience, where you are in the program and, and what apt adaptation that you're looking for. Um, and then you can, you know, make those decisions from there. And, and uh, we do a lot of medicine ball training, right? And, and I know you do as well. And, you know, when I'm starting to, you know, work with my athletes on medicine ball training, we use a fairly heavy medicine ball, but all we work on is catches. We just work on deceleration. I throw, they catch, I throw, they catch. And as we start to get to the point where they're going to be throwing and we want to focus on uh, speed power, we're using four pound med balls, right? I mean, we're using very, very small med balls to challenge those those positions because if it's too too heavy right it's going to actually 
change the technique. And when you change the technique, you're not going to probably have that carryover that you're looking for. Um, and it happens time and time again. So we have to understand that yes, load is important, technique and tempo is important, but depending on the adaptation that we're looking for, that is where it's even more important because if we try to do the wrong thing or we actually, we want a desired outcome, but we set it up the wrong way, you're never gonna get that. And um, you're, you're gonna get some adaptation. It's just probably not the one you were looking for. And it's, it's also not an exclusive uh, element. And what I mean by that is like, we put up a post earlier this week where um, I started off with a, a quote by the great Al Vermeil, um, who is a legendary strength coach. I think one of the few strength coaches, I think maybe the only strength coach in the world, he's won a world championship in the NBA, the MLB and the NFL. And um, he has a famous quote that if you need, you know, you want to be fast, you got to train fast. You want to be explosive. You want to train explosive. Now people took that and, and kind of, took that one sound bite and said, well, I'm I, now, if I do anything slow and controlled or static, it's a complete waste of time. And that's not the case that in the course of a session, I may do something that is static where there's no movement at all. I may do something that's slow and controlled. I may do something that has a slow eccentric with a fast concentric, you know, lower, slow, up fast. And other things I want to have be more but, uh, ballistic and dynamic. So it doesn't have to be all or one thing um, that it just makes sure you incorporate it and you incorporate it to the, to the percentage and ratio that your clients need it and your clients are capable of handling it. And then also looking at the bigger picture of what are they else they have the rest of the day. If I do a bunch of explosive uh, ballistic stuff today, well, that's going to that's going to fatigue my nervous system a little bit uh, in terms of what I'm going to be able to, to do the next day. So if I have a, a baseball pitcher who's got a, a pretty big bullpen lined up for the next day or, a, you know, an outing that they're going to pitch, I can't do a bunch of that stuff that's going to trash their nervous system. So they're going to be cooked the next day. So in terms of appreciating that and that kind of goes to the next point. And, and I love the term that you came up for this is uh, of doing poor incremental dosing. So since you came up with that, that, that wondrous uh, verbiage, I'm going to let you kind of start this one off. Yeah. So this is something that I think a lot of people uh, really, truly don't understand when it comes to designing a program. So a lot of people do to start off with that sort of high to low method, right? They start off with like four by 10 and or four by 12, and then they do that for a month and they do four by seven or four by eight and then four by six or whatever. But the, the problem with that is if you are working with a sedentary individual, someone that hasn't trained in a little bit of time, starting off doing 50 reps of a movement is probably not going to be optimal. So you can take that same movement and let's, let's use a squat, for example, rather than starting in a four by 10 or a four by 12, why wouldn't you just go day one, two by five? And then next week you could go, or next session, you could go, you could go two by six, you couldn't go three by four. It really doesn't make a difference, but you have to total the amount of repetitions that they're going to be performing within that workout, because I think people always just think add more, add more and add more. And yes, you can manipulate the sets and you can manipulate the reps, but when you are working with a new individual, you have to go slow. And because you don't want to murder them, right? I mean, a little bit of soreness is to be expected, but if they can't walk the next day, you overdid it. So I think we have to be really, really smart with how we progress things. And another thing we need to consider when we're working with clients, especially in sort of that rehab world. Now, I work with a lot of clients that they get done with physical therapy and then they start with me. And one of the things I have to do, let's say we're starting with a client that's had low back pain and we are going to start them with a, you know, a deadlift. And a lot of people will start off with five by five, right? The problem is, is you could do that five by five on day one, but two by five would have been just fine and they're not going to be as sore. But the other thing we need to consider is how are they going to feel that night? How are they going to feel the next day? And how are they going to feel two days down the road? Because let's be honest, unless you have sort of uh, something significant happen within a session, most, fee most people feel better when they, when they exercise. They, they get the endorphins going, the dopamine's going right. Everything feels great. But the problem is, is that if you overdid it, you may not know until 12, 16, 24, 36 hours later. So understanding how to dose things in an incremental fashion is the key to keeping your clients healthy, but not overdoing it. And I think the, the biggest issue we see in, uh, we see this too in, in the world of cardiovascular work, right? Especially running. So let's say someone does a mile and they do okay. What's the, what do they do next? They do two miles. They just doubled their total volume. 
And here's the crazy thing that would never happen in the weight room with a bench press because sometimes you just can't do it. Right. So take a, a person that um, was going to do four by 10 on a bench press. You're not going to go eight by 10 next week, or if they're going to lift hundred pounds, you can't go to 200 pounds next week. They're physically not ready for that. So I think people just, they don't think about the, the smart, intelligent jumps because they just think, well, I have to do it this way because this is the way it's always been done. Or they just think I have to have this perfect linear sort of progression where it's a 12 week thing. And, you know, weeks one through four are four by 10. And then we go to four by seven or four by eight and then four by six. And then we rinse and repeat. That's not necessarily a bad strategy for someone that is already that already has a decent amount of GPP and they're already active. But for, for the brand new client or the injured client that's returning to play or, you know, getting back to being, uh, you know, getting back to performance or even just training from living a sedentary lifestyle, man, two by five, and then next week doing two by six or doing by three by four or three by five. Those are the things that we need to consider because if we, if we dose it too much, um, we could piss off tissue. We could have too much, too much of an inflammatory response and they can have a ton of soreness. And if all of those things happen, it's going to be a deterrent. So next time they train, they're going to be like, well, last time I did this, I couldn't move my back hurt. And, you know, I felt like absolute rubbish. So I think the idea of incremental dosing is just making sure that as you increase something, you just need to be smart about it. And then once you understand what your client is capable of from a dosing standpoint, then you'll start to learn uh, what I call their trends, your client's trends, how they respond to things in general. And then you can make better decisions once you have some training experience in the bank. So being a fan of language, I'm just going to go back and highlight that rubbish is a fantastic word. Good, good, Great good reverse. usage. Good, good usage. Um, so uh, I think a part of this is managing, you know, two things is managing your, your minimums and also having some sort of milestones, right? And we have a, we have one of our Instagrams live and we'll probably come back and visit the, the concept of minimums, right? That if you can't touch your toes, you probably shouldn't deadlift, right? And, uh, and, and we can see this in a bunch of different things that if you can't, uh, if you have terrible single leg balance or you have no ankle mobility, you probably shouldn't go out and do a run. So all these sorts of things, kind of having minimums, like you gotta at least do this before you could do this. Like I'll start a lot of people off in their strength work with a lot of unilateral work. And I have some numbers that I put together from people like Joe DeFranco and Chad Werderberry and, and Dan John of numbers we kind of hit percentage of body weight that you wanna hit in things like a single arm overhead press or floor press or split squat and that kind of stuff. And then it's also managing your milestones. Like when is enough enough? When am I going to hit that mark? And am I actually getting to those? Um, because on one side, you're talking about where you have the drill sergeant that, you know, and I have to hold the reins on, like I said, on the coaches that I work with to say day one, you can't go take a blowtorch to them just to prove how tough we're going to be. We're going to be a tough team and we're going to just day one run you into the ground that doesn't work but at the same time you also have you know or the the world that we spend a lot of time in is dealing with the people who get sucked into the corrective exercise vortex of where they just wrap people in bubble wrap and don't ever really prepare them for the demands of what they're, they're going to need to make and and so the expression i use is that if you if you treat your people like house cats all the time eventually when they go outside the alley cats are going to kill so uh, we need to make sure we have that right balance of, of all that kind of stuff. And then you also have to appreciate that, you know, number seven is really is how do you adjust your program? Can you adapt your program and coaching style to your, to your client's personality? Like there's a, a thing we talk about in our course and Mikey do a great job of talking about the baker versus the chef and just even how people like the delivery of their program. Like, do I want this spreadsheet with reps and sets and all my weights programmed out? Or do I want like a little bit looser, more free flowing type of thing, right? Absolutely. And I think uh, oftentimes, depending on the individual, they'll start off with one learning style and eventually they'll move on to something else or maybe they won't. So it's just understanding and having an honest conversation with people um, all the time. I tell people, hey, uh, are you the type of person that's going to track your weights? No. Okay, cool. That's fine. Like, I'm not going to force you. I say you probably should. That way you can make better decisions. But if you, if you want to go by feel, that's okay. But if you feel like you're getting stuck or you're getting bogged down, it's nice to be able to look back and see what the trends were, right? So that's, a, that's something that I think people miss. And um, just understanding the personality of your clients, I think, is, is going to be huge. And, and also understanding what they will and will not do, because um, a lot of people start off with good intentions, but after a few weeks, it doesn't go so well. So 
I think having those honest conversations with your clients and, and, and I do it all the time. Someone will come in and, you know, they'll have a little bit of work to do from a corrective standpoint. And I tell them, Hey, if I give you two to three exercises that will take five to eight minutes a day, will you do them? Some people be like, yeah, I'll totally do them. Other people are like, no, I'm like, okay, cool. That's totally fine. But just when you go to the gym, I just want you to potentially avoid these and avoid these. Now, I, I want to take a little bit of a sidebar here because uh, I think it's important to cover when it comes to movement in general. And we talked about, you, you know, mentioned ankle mobility and running, et cetera. If you have a restricted ankle, does it mean that you cannot run? No, it doesn't mean that you cannot run. It just means that if you keep on running and you keep on hammering your body and, and redlining, I'm going to tell you right now, eventually, eventually something is going to go sour. It may happen in four weeks. It may happen in eight weeks. It may happen in 12. But my point is, is that it's all about just thinking about the long game. What's the most important thing? Is it to make sure that you need to go out now and sprint hard? Or is, are you thinking long-term? And I think when we talk about milestones and when we tell people, hey, you should do this or you should be able to do this before you do this, we're not saying that you're going to burst into flames if you, you know, perform that exercise. What we are saying is, listen, you got to pump the brakes a little bit. If you want to perform at your highest level and be as healthy as possible, we need to spend a little bit of time cleaning some things up before we go ahead and hit the gas pedal. It doesn't mean that we can't train. It doesn't mean that you're, you're, you know, you're going to be in corrective exercise purgatory. It just means that if you do, you know, sort of check these boxes before you enter an exercise program, your chances of getting results are going to be improved and your chances of just feeling better in general are going to be that much greater. And, and that's what we're talking about when it comes to, you know, hitting those, those minimums from a movement standpoint. And we've all heard the term, you know, uh, don't load dysfunction, right? And, and some people are always like, oh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. And guys, we know what the real answer is. It's called, it depends. Show me the situation. Let's talk about context and we can go from there. But listen, if someone has a really, really crappy squat pattern and unloaded uh, crappy squat pattern, can you give them a load? Yes. Would I? No. And that's what it boils down to. As a coach, we need to make better decisions and we need to think about the long-term health of our clients, not just about how quickly we can redline, redline them. And, and that's that's one something that I really wanted to really talk about a little bit because so many people just think that um, we're saying you shouldn't ever do this or do this. It's like, no, but why wouldn't you spend a little bit of time just cleaning a few things up before you exercise. I mean, I think most people would agree that when they warm up correctly, they feel better and they perform better. I mean, most people aren't going to go through a thorough warm up and be like, wow, I feel exponentially worse. No, people feel better. And when you feel better, you're more apt to perform at a higher level and you have more confidence in your ability. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to um, sort of passing those minimums, right? And, and I think just far too many people just love to just get in those arguments online about that. But it's just like, listen, we, every single scenario that's out there, we can go back and forth and we can talk about this and we can talk about this and we can share our favorite PubMed articles. But that at the end of the day, it's what is the most important for your client and their goals. And, and I think, and everybody that I work with, the most important thing is to keep them as healthy as possible. Now I'm going to just kind of put a bow on, 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 um, number seven here with the personality is that you, you have the two extremes. I would say you have the, the one end is your negotiators, right? Where it's a matter of, they're not going to do a complete food log and track their grams of protein and, and do all things that, you know, that would make our lives a lot easier and make the results a lot better. It may be just a negotiation to say, listen, and I've had this because I deal with high school kids. It's listen, you can't eat anything with a cartoon on the box for the next week. How about that? Right. How about that? Um, uh, nothing you can get in a gas station for the next week. Right. How about that? So that would be like, that's a negotiation or like you said, I need you to do two things every day. That's it. Two minutes, two things every day. Then on the opposite end, you have your box of nails people, you know, and I say, if I, those are the clients where if I gave them a box of nails, I said, I need you to eat every nail in this box. And then they're going to come back two days later with an empty box and saying, okay, is that good? Do I need another one? Like they'll do whatever. And so there, and then there's everything in the middle. So learning who needs the, the, the pat in the back and who needs the, the kick in the butt and, and being able to do that. And Brett Bartholomew does a really nice job in conscious coaching, talking about all the different personality types and how you address that. Now that goes to number eight in, in, there is a problem of not tracking enough. And that that's on our side, not so much the clients journaling everything, but on our side, how do I know 
if you're moving towards your goal, if we're getting closer, if we've met those minimums or, or, or milestones, if I don't track anything, right? And how many times have we seen a trainer goes out on the floor and they got their hands in their pockets, runs through a session, and then goes to the next session and nothing is tracked. Nothing is, you know, they're going on memory of, hey, I think you did 80 pounds on this last time or, you know, th there's nothing to, to give a, a real milestone or a real uh, carrot in front of the, the client to, to get them to keep coming other than, hey, I'm just showing a bunch of exercises. So, uh, I think one of the things that does is not only impede your results, but I think you're missing a huge part of what we're here to do, um, which is give uh, empower people and give them ownership. And, and so the conversation I have with my clients is say, look, you know, the first, I'm, I'm going to give you a little quick test on exercise science. I said, when we train, do we build up or break down? And they say, um, build up. And I'll say, try again. So I break down and say, yes. And it's not like you hear in muscle and fitness, like you tear the muscle fiber to build it back. It's basically you're challenging yourself. It's stress and adaptation. Like you said, it's intermittent stress where your body then responds to it in, in kind. And it does it to temperature. It does it to, to all sorts of different positive stressors. And so with that, I say the magic isn't happening here. The magic is happening the other hours of the day. And so all we're doing is planting the seeds. And I'm not even planting the seeds. I'm just telling you which seeds, when to plant them, and where to plant them, and why. It's on you to plant the seeds. And more importantly, it's on you to provide the soil. And that I say, look, we're in the gym. If you plant the seeds on this rubber, rubber floor, nothing is going to grow. And I said, what do you think is going to make that soil fertile so it can grow those seeds? Well, that's what happens the other 23 hours a day. And the, the big two in that is your sleep and your nutrition. So that gives you the ownership to say that I can give you the greatest program in the world. I'll put mine against, uh, against most people, but it, you're a complete waste of time. If you're not managing that soil and giving yourself, you know, managing your stressors, getting the right sleep, getting the right nutrition, all that. And so that gets them to kind of, to, to shift gears and get an awareness of it's not, I show up, I do some magic workout and then stuff happens. It's a matter of taking ownership that this is a, this is, and I always say, if I'm working with you, Mike, this is project Mike, and this is a 24 hour day project. It doesn't mean you need to go to bed at eight o'clock every night and steam, chick, eat steam chicken and broccoli, but it means to understand that everything you're going to do has a positive or negative consequence. And so we have to make the right decisions and establish the right habits. So I think tracking allows us to, to, to give clients ownership of that type of, of type of, type of situation. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, all my clients I track, I mean, my, my computer is just full of programs and, uh, you know, I think one of the things, um, another reason why, uh, we should absolutely track is, uh, how many times have you worked with a client? And this is more of a rhetorical question. They say, is that good? And it's like, well, compared to who and compared to what, right? I mean, you know, I've worked with guys in the NFL. If you're saying, is this good? And you're talking about a guy that can deadlift, you know, 600 pounds. Well, you know, based off of the numbers, no, it's not good, but it doesn't matter. What's important is that you're doing better than you were a month or six weeks ago. And um, I think that a lot of the times we just have issues with, um, with tracking in general, but um, it's a nice way to show your clients what they've done in the past and, and show them that, hey, you have made progress. It just may not be as fast as you'd like. Now, the next, the, we're winding down here. The next one is, is kind of really... Um, one of my main things that I talk a lot about in the course is not being adaptable to your current state of readiness, meaning that we write programs based on an organism that walk, walks in our door. We do an evaluation of, we, we talk to them about their goals and we find out about their history. We write this program and then we write this program, assuming that that's what they're going to be forever. Right. And when they come back in for their workout the next week, that's a different organism in front of you because since the last time you saw them, they might have taken a, an eight hour cross country flight. They might have had a fight with their wife. They might have slept on the couch and now their back is all jacked up. They might have, um, you know, gone through a number of different things that changes their current physiological state, which changes their readiness, their ability, basically changes, to go back to my analogy earlier, changes the soil in which you're planting the seeds. And so because of that, you need to adapt um, properly. Like a, a good farmer knows how to track the weather and knows the right time to plant those seeds and how much to plant based on what's going on with the weather and, 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 and where the soil is at on that given day. And so being able to adapt your program based on someone's current state of readiness and how do you actually gauge that readiness, whether it's using tech like a, 
a whoop band, an aura ring, a, a, a Morpheus strap, something like that, whether it's something in terms of looking at their current movement readiness, whether it's looking at their nervous system readiness through things like grip strength um, uh, or, a, a, you know, a tap test or, or the uh, motor control screen or looking even something like at a breath hold test to say, okay, where are you at now based on your baselines? And today is the day to either you know, push the pedal and learn a new skill or try a new max or add volume, or today's the day to, to kind of pump the brakes a little bit and maybe make some tweaks to the program, or maybe today's program needs to completely get put on the shelf and we need to totally switch up what we had planned for today because you're just not ready for what I had in mind. And so being able to adapt that and not just plow ahead to say that this is my macro cycle and we have to hit these marks and this is your program no matter what, is the is comes in where we talk about the, the science and art of training that's really the art of training right there yeah absolutely and i think uh, another thing that we need to really consider too is is um yes we we have to know what's going on with our clients but most of the time if you've worked with someone for a while and they've been training for a while they're pretty aware of how they're feeling um yes it's nice to have metrics and hrv and we can do that other stuff but i found that when when your client or athlete is really in tune with their bodies, they kind of know that, Hey man, you know, things aren't really, things aren't really jiving like they normally would. Right. And uh, I have a, a one client and I've been training this guy for 11 years and I can tell by the way, he walked into the gym, what we need to do that day. And we do have a program that we write, but I'm like, you good. I'm like, I walk, you walk in. He's like, yeah, you know, I, I worked in the yard and I blah, blah, blah. I'm like, we're going to do a, a regen day. He's like, yeah, we're going to need to do a regen day. And that's where, we, you know, we hop on a bike and we do, you know, maybe eight to 10 minutes of biking. We do a bunch of soft tissue, a bunch of mobility work, and then just a little bit more sort of light cardio. Um, and just that's a setup day, right? That's a setup day for the next workout, because we know that today, if we hammered the workout and we tried to push through, who knows, that's probably when we're going to get injured. And, and there's no need for that because listen, your, your entire fitness level and your, your, you know, your current strength it didn't happen in one day and it's not going to, you're not going to have a detraining effect in one day. It's just not going to. So I use those days as like a setup day to say, Hey, listen today, you know, we're not going to do our game plan, but here's what we are going to do. We're going to get you prepped up. So tomorrow we can hit this. So what I need you to do is do what I tell you, get a good night's sleep, make sure you stay hydrated, eat some good food, and then go from there. And then another thing we need to talk about from an adaptability standpoint is what is happening later on in the day, because there are certain scenarios I work with a lot of fighters. If they're doing double or triple sessions, I know that as we get closer to a fight camp, if they have a hard wrestling session in the evening, I need to change my program that morning so they're not they're not going to be exhausted. Maybe you know I have to cut the volume in half or or do something else to to manipulate the training because certain things take certain priorities, right? And those are some considerations that we just have to think about when we're asking our athletes to do certain things because yeah you know what I love my athletes to come in and try then guess what I, I did them a disservice because what's more what's more important that they're really good at wrestling or that they do a bunch of weighted pull-ups right we just have to think of what the priority is within the week and actually within the day as well so uh the one point i would somewhat argue is that that you know that people are, are well aware of their bodies now when you get to finally two athletes they're they're better um, but most people i joke are just a, a head attached to a carcass right that's just floating um and so they have no idea and but what having some sort of standard standardization for your readiness and i, I have a, a quick screen i put people through it takes all of two to three minutes is what it does is open conversation and that ties in with something you brought up and what are really our last thing and i think our biggest point is it opens conversation and it asks us to ask key questions. We have a whole section of the course called the key questions that we ask people. So let's say you come in today and your breath hold is normally 20 to 25 seconds. And all of a sudden today it's 13. So I don't just skip past that and put it in my notes. So I'm going to say, Hey, listen, what's up is, you know, is everything okay? And they say, Oh, well, no, I had a lousy night's sleep or, Oh, I had a work dinner last night. I probably had too much wine. Now they didn't come in offering that information, right? You're right. And and they they weren't aware of that impact because they weren't connecting the dots. And so because of that, then that says, okay, well, you know, how long you've been sleeping poorly? Yeah, the whole week I've really been sleeping crappy. And so now you start to get more of a story. And that's had I not had that 
that tripwire, right? Had I not had that um, that sort of, of, of kind of quick pop quiz for them, they're not going to share that information. And now I'm going to find out three sets in into their deadlifts that, oh, my back is killing me now. It's not the deadlift as being the problem. It's that you weren't ready. You're a different person than you were last week. If we've been doing this program for three weeks, now all of a sudden on week three, you're having a problem with it. It's probably not the program. It's probably what you're bringing to the program. And so a lot of that is asking the right questions. And, and you know, we teach a movement uh, screening system. Uh, we talk a lot about, we have a whole section of course about evaluation and, and, and data collection. But sometimes the best evaluation is a really good conversation and asking what we call these key questions. And so what it avoids is, you know, the analogy I use is don't give farmer's walks to a guy who's a bricklayer all day. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't ask the question, like, what do you do throughout the day? If you find out that somebody sits at a, at a, um, a desk for 10 hours a day and doesn't move because they're, they're trading stocks is that you're going to have to consider certain mobility limitations that person's probably going to be bringing to the table if they show up after a 10-hour day in front of a desk that you're going to need to address before you jump into your program, as opposed to if they come in Saturday morning after, you know, just after waking up. So that's where we got to ask the right questions, because if you don't, you're going to miss the boat. And these questions aren't going to be necessarily your tr traditional PARQ or medical history. It's not going to necessarily be um, things you're going to see on a movement screen or a performance test or some sort of cardiovascular measure. These are things to find out about the individual, the unique organism that you're working with. Yeah. And, and to, to your point, I think the conversations are important. One of the things that I do with my clients is uh, the first thing they come in is how did you sleep? What time did you get off work last night? And, and again, like you were saying, you use, maybe it's a top tier or it could be breath holding or whatever. I always start right away. How are you feeling? How did you sleep? What time did you get out of work? That's how I start my my every single session because you know uh, you know I have a client that does international business. He's like I had a call you know to Singapore at eleven thirty a.m. and you know I stayed up too late. So I think re I think as long as you are inquiring about sort of their day to day readiness in some way, shape, or form, I think is huge. And whether you do it through conversation or whether or not you do it through um, some sort of you know basic rescreening techniques or using a top tier breath hold. I think as long as you can capture that information, I think it's going to be important because I've noticed that 95% of the time, if my client's like, man, I didn't sleep while I'm over, I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. I'm already making the decision to, uh, to change and alter the program because if they are voluntarily giving up the, Hey, the fact that they're not feeling well, they're back sore. I know that I need to make a change. And, and for me, like I said, one workout is not going to necessarily make a huge difference. And uh, there are some times where I can actually see right away, um, you know, based off of like some of their warm ups and, and how they're moving or, and or how they even get up and down off the ground. I mean, as a guy that does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's some days where getting up and down off the floor after a hard week is, is, is a little bit tougher than I would have thought. So I think as long as you're finding a way to to ask those key questions and capture that information, I think you're doing it the right way. But I think there are several different approaches, right? Um, and it's all about just adaptability. As long as we're trending, everything is trending in the right direction, we should be good to go. But, you know, it's like, uh, it's like that sort of meme or all those memes that have been going around. It's like what people think success looks like. And it's this 45 degree straight line, right? Where it's like, here's your starting point. Here's your success. When in actuality, it's, it's this ebb and flow of ups and downs. And, and I think as long as we are trending in the right direction, those ups and downs are, they're significant. But at the end of the day, if we, if we reach our goal, that's a good thing. Asking the key questions and the right questions also ties back to efficiency, right? So if you don't ask, like one of the things on my onboarding, onboarding questionnaire is like, okay, what do you do for, what, what kind of physical activity do you do all throughout your week? You don't have that question and you find out after the fact that, hey, this person does Peloton four days a week. Well, then it was probably a waste of time for me to be doing echo bike finishers this whole time with you, right? Yeah. I could have been doing something else because our biggest enemy, if you talk to anybody in the world, and, and one of the other things in my onboarding questionnaire is, um, what do you think is going to be your biggest challenge to not reaching your goal? And almost nine times out of a 10, it's, it's time, right? I just don't have enough time to do all the things that we want to do. And so because of that, we need to be really economical. And so if you don't ask what you're doing outside of this, if this person's going and doing a boot camp class, or they're doing Peloton, or they're doing these other things on their own, well, that's one less box that I need to check. 
So I need to make sure that I ask these questions because if I don't consider that, that, then I'm going to miss that and my program is going to suffer because of that. And so to kind of put a bow on all of it is, is all of these mistakes, right? Uh, and especially, you know, the reason why we highlight this one, you know, uh, last but not least is that we, we want to have this concept and whether it's in our podcast and whether it's in our courses that at the end of listening to us, um, we want you to say, wow, I never thought of that. Or, oh man, that, that, that kind of makes a lot of sense. I, I need to start looking at that, right? Because you can only see what you're looking for. And so to give you a new lens, you know, when I, before I knew movement screening, I didn't know the difference between a, a one squat or the next. And then once you kind of see it, you can't kind of unsee it. And now you start watching people walk in the airport and you see how they move. And so the same thing we want to have is, is to give you a new set of eyes and a new set of ears to, to kind of consider a whole bunch of factors so you don't miss stuff. Because that's really, you know, if we put it all a bow around, what are the, all these 10 things mean? Is we miss stuff somewhere along the way. And if somewhere is, and this is really any profession, but I know for myself, and in, in, in I think Coach Boyle or, or someone has a great quote that, you know, if you're not looking back at what you did a month or six months or a year ago and saying, oof, I probably shouldn't have done that, then you're not growing, right? And, and, and you're, not, you're not doing your, your a service to your clients and your patients and your teams and, and athletes. And so I, I think by getting us to challenge ourselves a little bit better, we can start to become better um, because we don't miss anything. Right. So uh, any final thoughts, Mr. Perry? No, I think, uh, you know, these are some some basic principles of, of what we do day in and day out. And I think a lot of the times people get so enamored with sets and reps and, and you know, what is the perfect program in the Excel spreadsheet? Right. And when it boils down to it, yes, the, the program is important, but it's the other factors in life and, and, and those are just as important as the X's and O's. And I think far too many people are thinking about the perfect template of with this periodization scheme and this and that, and this and that, and those things are important, but that program is rubbish. If you're not taking care of your body and you're not taking care of all of those other things, um, when you're not actually exercising and, uh, you know, getting fit and getting healthy is, a is a journey. And, and there's so many factors within that journey. And it's easy to miss some of those factors, right? It's, it's just, we have to be able to step back and look at the big picture to see, you know, truly how we can make the biggest impact with our clients and athletes. And I think if we just focus, you know, if we have our, 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 our binoculars on, or we're, we're, we're looking through that, that sort of, um, you know, that, that sort of lens where all we think about is performance and weights and numbers and stress and, and training hard, we're going to miss things. Well, this has been fun. We, we're, we're embarking on, a, on an awesome journey here. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us at the Principles of Performance. Um, if you want to find out more about us, you can go to principlesofprogramdesign.com or you can find us on social media and we will have all of our links uh, in the show notes. Um, we want to hear from you. If you have ideas for shows or questions, please feel free to reach out. We thank you for joining us. And we hope to hear you next time. Thanks. Guys.